Welcome to the Flight Safety Detectives. Hosts John Golia and Greg Fife, two of the world's most respected aviation safety experts, talk all things related to aviation and aerospace. This podcast and the Flight Safety Detectives YouTube channel are brought to you by the Professional Aviation Maintenance Association, PAMA, and Avemco Insurance, a world-class provider of aviation insurance and your one stop for all general aviation insurance needs. Get a customized quote at avemco.com or give them a call at 888-879-0389. Tell them you're a listener of the show and receive a 5% discount. Now it's time to buckle up because it's wheels up for the latest episode of Flight Safety Detectives. Well, hello, it's another episode of Flight Safety Detectives. Unfortunately, we don't have the detectives. I'm flying solo today. I'm Greg Fife. My partner, John Golia, is down in Dallas. He is presiding over his world-renowned maintenance competition. And uh, from what I hear from the intel I'm getting, it sounds like competition is definitely heating up. So I think that uh, on a future show, we'll be talking in depth about the competition, the competitors, um, and the fact that it is growing. Uh, this is a, a great thing that uh, John has continued to preside over for quite a long time. He has a passion for it, and it's an opportunity for maintenance technicians who don't get a lot of the glory, good, bad, or indifferent, uh, when it comes to uh, aircraft maintenance to show off their skills, their abilities, and of course, their knowledge. So uh, we're going to look forward to uh, debriefing John on that particular uh, element and uh, and I hope that uh, he has a good time because the rest of us have to do some work. So anyway, uh, let's uh, let's move on since I am flying solo. Um, this has been a busy week again for fatal aircraft accidents in in amongst all of the uh, other accidents and incidents that we've had. The proverbial running off the side of the runway, damaging an airplane, uh, trying to land or take off when. Probably a pilot shouldn't have done that, but uh, unfortunately, we've had three serious fatal accidents that, uh, that again, I, I, you shake your head at. And uh, of course, I've always talked about training, 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 and we had another training event over this past week. It was a Cessna 340 down in Georgia. Um, some early intel says that that airplane may have come out of New Mexico. Now, whether or not this was because uh, the new buyer, if it was for sale, the new buyer was located in Georgia and was receiving some training in the airplane, or it was just registered down in, uh, in uh, New Mexico and actually resided in Georgia, that's to be ferreted out. But from uh, early information, uh, apparently it was a uh, pilot and a flight instructor performing touch and go takeoffs and landings in this airplane for training of some sort. Um, it had already um, committed to a number of takeoffs and landings just prior to the accident. This was a departure, so the airplane uh, was on the takeoff and during the initial climb out, witnesses in the uh, local area indicated that they observed the airplane and heard the airplane and believed that there was some sort of engine issue that had developed. Um, their description of the event was that the airplane was uh, having, quote, trouble gaining altitude, uh, followed by an immediate uh, veering or right turn into a, a steep bank turn, which led to then uh, an uncontrolled descent. The airplane crashed in the vicinity of a uh, General Mills uh, food plant. It crashed into a number of tractor trailer trucks in a storage area right near the plant. And of course, there's uh, a lot of concern with the fact that there's occupied buildings in close proximity to an airport. And this could have killed a lot of people, which it could have. Unfortunately, uh, only two fatalities. Uh, the oh, parent owner or uh, student in this case, we don't know what level of certification he had and a flight instructor of some sort. So uh, of course the NTSB is gonna be not only sifting through the wreckage to look for mechanical malfunctions and failures, 
of the aircraft that may have caused or contributed to the accident. But of course, they're going to be looking at qualifications of both pilots on board to see exactly what the nature of the training may have been, what they may have been trying to do, what probably got them in trouble. Um, so again, this is, uh, it's, it gets back to training. Uh, I preach it all the time. While I'm happy to hear that they were attempting to do some training, my concern now has been over about the last year, we've had an escalation in training related accidents. And the concern of course is proficiency, not only of the person being trained, but also the instructor themselves. Um, COVID did a lot to put a lot of people on the ground, get them behind the proficiency curve, especially flight instructors. And now things are ramping back up, um, but that doesn't mean that a pilot and or a flight instructor can automatically step right back into it. Even flight instructors need a little proficiency training before they go out and start instructing. So uh, that's gonna be uh, a, a concern. And I think an issue that the NTSB and the FAA should be looking at uh, to make sure that uh, that wasn't necessarily the case. But again, even if they had some sort of engine issue, you have a flight instructor on board for the very reason that they have the higher level of knowledge, the skills, abilities, and knowledge that is. And if something is starting to develop, why aren't they taking corrective action in a timely manner? And there are set procedures. This was a Cessna 340. So it does have a lot of power. Um, but again, in this particular issue, if a problem started to develop, other than an instantaneous engine failure, uh, what the corrective actions should have been and why they weren't taken in a timely manner. So these are the kinds of things that I believe the NTSB and the FAA will, uh, will be examining very closely, as well as the mechanical aspects to see if that was the facilitating uh, factor in this particular accident. Then we go all the way across the country uh, out to Whiteman Field in California, where there was a Cessna 337 uh, Super Skymaster that uh, it uh, has a nickname called the Mixmaster um, because this isn't your conventional twin engine airplane, piston engine airplane. Uh, it has an engine mounted in the front like a conventional single engine airplane, but it also has in line with it, a second engine mounted in the, uh, in the fuselage in the rear of the airplane. It does make it a multi-engine airplane, it's center line thrust. And in this particular instance with the initial facts that have come out uh, from the NTSB and other sources, it appears that this airplane may have been down and, and having maintenance done to it. And that uh, this may have been a maintenance test flight uh, the pilot did report that uh, he was having a landing gear issue as a single pilot in the aircraft, trying to manage the airplane itself while dealing with not necessarily emergency, but if you have some mechanical malfunction or failure, especially with the landing gear, again, there are requisite procedures and steps that you have to follow uh, with, with regard to getting the landing gear down, whether he's trying to troubleshoot it or just crank the gear down manually that's yet to be determined, but you're managing not only the gear issue, but you still have to fly the airplane. You're in some crowded airspace out there. So you have to worry about the operation of the aircraft and the operational discipline. And these are the factors that the NTSB and the FAA, again, will be looking at. What was the maintenance that was being done? Uh, there were a number of short flights that had been conducted prior to this accident flight. Were they maintenance test flights? Were they fixing uh, various things on this airplane. It is an older airplane. It was built in the 60s. It is a solid airplane, if, like anything else, is maintained properly. But the mechanical aspects, and now you get the, the pilot. Is he deviating from operational discipline? Is he distracted? Is he focused his attention with his head down, trying to crank this gear down, fix the gear problem, look for a solution to this gear problem in flight? while trying to fly the airplane, manage talking to ATC, manage the airplane in the airspace uh, near Whiteman Field. All of these things uh, are gonna have to be looked at by the safety board and the FAA to come up with a true probable cause that will be beneficial. Uh, this pilot unfortunately lost his life. He, uh, the airplane again, looks like it stalled, either spun or spiraled. 
um, in close proximity to the airport. And of course, the, uh, the neighboring communities around this particular airport have been calling for the closure of this airport, Whiteman Field, for quite a long time. And uh, you get the, the typical politicians sticking their nose into it, talking about general aviation and general aviation safety. And this is just another example of why there shouldn't be airports in communities. And of course, I don't support that in any way, shape or form. It's a busy day at the airport where my office is here at Rocky Mountain Metropolitan Airport in uh, Broomfield, KBJC. And uh, on a day like today, there is a lot of training going on. There are a lot of little airplanes flying in the pattern, but the surrounding communities don't like that airplane noise. And they feel that their safety is in jeopardy because of all the small airplanes flying over their head. But I think I'd rather be underneath the flight pattern of an airport than being on some of our highways right now, because we've killed a lot of people <laughs> since the beginning of this year again in automobile and truck accidents and of course bus accidents. So um, I think all of these issues uh, in some way, shape or form are going to have some sort of impact on this accident. But for the NTSB and the FAA, their primary concern is what was going on with the airplane? What was going on with the pilot? And why did this airplane come down uncontrolled uh, during this particular flight? And then we come back towards the east to Cedar City, Utah. And again, this was a, a, a very unfortunate accident like they all are, but this one uh, tugs at the heartstrings because the four young adults that were involved in this accident who were fatalities leave behind a number of young children. Um, this was a, uh, a Diamond DA-40, which is a single engine four place aircraft, 180 horsepower. Uh, the pilot, the private rated pilot happened to be a sheriff's deputy. It was very popular, very well known in the area where he lived and worked. And uh, he had taken his wife and uh, a relative and, and his girlfriend up for a quote sightseeing flight in the local area. They had flown uh, about two hours prior to the accident, refueled the airplane probably and uh, we're heading out for a continuation of the sightseeing flight. Now the DA-40, it is a good machine like any other single engine machine, but you have to look at all the external factors, all of the weather factors. And in this case, even though the sun was shining and uh, the, you know they had a high ceiling and things like that, you have to worry about temperature and of course, density altitude. And as my partner, John Golia always preaches at the end of our show, where we're talking about pre-planning and pre-flight uh, actions by the pilot. This is no different. And that is you have a, an airplane that has four adults, possibly full fuel. So you're already starting off heavy and somewhat behind the power curve. Now you add on top of that, the elevation of the airport. And of course, because of the temperature in, uh, in the Cedar City area at the time, you have a high density altitude. You know that aircraft performance is gonna be a major, major issue for you just under normal circumstances. But uh, contributing to that, Cedar City, Utah is surrounded by high terrain. Um, there isn't a lot of distance between the airport and this higher terrain. And to think that you can take off and then point your nose at that high terrain and uh, possibly out climb it um, is, is really a fallacy. And in a single engine airplane that's heavy, uh, on a day like uh, that um, in Cedar City on that particular day, density altitude was high. There are requisite activities, there are requisite procedures that pilots should be following. If you are gonna fly into that area of high terrain, you either circle climb over a lower elevation area, even over the airport, before you then point your nose towards higher terrain. In this particular instance, uh, some of the chatter that's online and a number of the blogs indicate that this pilot may have taken off and started heading right towards high terrain. Of course, aircraft performance is gonna be a central theme for the NTSB and the FAA to look at in doing their accident investigation. And when you look at the accident site itself, it appears that the airplane, because of the com uh, compact size or the contained area of the wreckage, 
there were some aerial views that have been posted online. As an investigator looking at that, it would indicate that there was probably, again, another event where the pilot got himself into a situation where possibly the terrain started to outclimb the performance of the airplane. The pilot may have realized it and either continued to try and outclimb the terrain or possibly made the decision to turn and uh, basically retreat. And during the course of one of those actions, ended up inadvertently stall spinning or stall spiraling that airplane. And because of their close proximity to the ground, they were unable to recover, or the pilot was unable to recover before ground impact. Tragic loss of life. And it's all about planning. Having not only a, a desired route that you know that you and your aircraft can transit, um, but it relies on performance. Uh, and again, these are the kinds of things that even though this was just a personal sightseeing flight, you have to go back and look at the, the pilot's personal skills, abilities, and knowledge, his proficiency in this airplane, in this environment. And I even go back to training. Was he doing training on a regular basis? What was the training he had received um, you know, for his private pilot license? How much emphasis? It's obvious that he flies in this area. This was a rental aircraft. So it's obvious that he was familiar with these particular areas that he had been flying in. But the key here is how proficient, why didn't he, if, uh, if they can find out, why didn't he do some aircraft performance to know that you just don't go blasting off into high terrain? These are the kinds of issues that as an investigator, you shake your head, especially when you have to go out there and you see this loss of life and, and the, the family members that have been left behind um, because of a decision. I'm not going to say that it was a bad decision and a wrong decision. I mean, it's kind of obvious that, that, you know, because of the accident, you could surmise or come to that conclusion. But there could be some extenuating circumstances that at this point in time, we don't know about. And that's why it's going to be important that the NTSB and the FAA do a thorough and methodical investigation of this accident, like any accident, because it's these underlying factors that may not be so obvious right now without thorough and methodical investigation. The fact is, is that when you look at these three, the, these three accidents, again, we have an escalation in fatal accidents this, uh, in this year. People are coming out of the COVID uh, lockdown, they're getting into airplanes, they're flying more. And of course, uh, with pilot training on the increase because of the quote pilot shortage for commercial aviation, um, there's a lot of activity out there. So uh, it is a concern. Um, we need to be uh, learning lessons from these particular accidents so that we can prevent them going forward. Uh, and, and as I get more information, uh, John and I, hopefully he will be back here uh, for the next show. Uh, we'll be talking about that. And I'm even going to ask Todd, one of our contributors who, to the flight safety detectives. He is part of the, uh, the cast and, uh, and he's back flying. So we're gonna talk to him about some of the lessons he's learned from being on the show, the things that we talk about and what now he is learning from the dissection of these accidents as he applies it in his own flying. I do it on a regular basis. When I do my flying, um, I'm constantly thinking about the things that we talk about. Uh, one, so that uh, I don't become the headline that safety guy crashes an airplane. That, that uh, would be quite an embarrassment. So uh, we're going to be uh, dissecting more of these issues, but it is one of those things that we need to be aware of. We're coming into now an escalation of the flying season as we transition from spring to summer. Uh, a lot of people are going to be out flying. They get the airplane out of mothballs, if you will. And it's going to be one of those issues where while the airplane may be airworthy and capable of doing the mission. Are you the pilot capable of doing the mission? Are you the pilot airworthy, if you will? Are you proficient? Are you comfortable? Are you confident with the abilities? Not trying to learn on the fly, but having that level of proficiency and confidence before you start conducting flight operations, especially where you're carrying passengers and, and your family, of course. Um, these are the kinds of things that you have to ask yourself and you have to take that moment and be real. 
look at yourself in the mirror and actually think, am I ready? Am I prepared? And as I'm always preaching, and, and I try to do it myself uh, on every single occasion in an airplane, and that is, if you're going to fly and you have to take actions of any kind, you always want to know that you're executing with purpose. That is, you don't just execute, especially in an abnormal or emergency situation, to do things. You have to understand what it is that you're going to do and why you're going to do it before you do it. I know too many pilots who have put themselves in a position of jeopardy because a situation has cropped up, even a benign situation, but they've turned it into an emergency because they started to do things without really understanding why they were doing it. They just felt the need they had to do something. That oftentimes puts you as a pilot in a position of jeopardy because now you've escalated a benign situation to a, to a level that you don't wanna to have to use your extraordinary piloting skills. Um, we try to reserve those. Uh, we all think we're Chuck Yeager in the back of our mind sometime and we can handle things. But again, I never wanna have to use those extraordinary skills to get myself out of a situation that I put myself into. And of course, put my family or friends at risk who I'm flying in the airplane. So with all of that being said, um, you know, flying solo like this in a show, uh, there are always the, the editorial comments. And so from, from our Whiskey Tango Foxtrot file, I have to talk about uh, the recent stunt that the Red Bull team tried to pull off in Arizona, where they were taking two Cessna 182s that were modified so that they could fly vertical. And then you have the two pilots who have parachutes on who will jump out of two perfectly good airplanes to do this in-flight swap, if you will, where the pilots jump between the airplanes, get in the other airplane, and then fly it to the ground. Well, it, it, it was great internet theater, if you will. Of course, there was a lot of hype leading up to it. And, and of course, anytime you see Red Bull being involved, you know they have the air race competition, they have uh, the pylon races that friends of mine have flown in, and in those kinds of things, and those are very controlled. And of course, Red Bull sponsors a number of uh, aerobatic pilots that, you know, again, put on a great show. But this was really for theater. Now, the, the team had applied to the FAA for a waiver to be able to do this. And right up till the 11th hour, if you will, uh, the FAA had been mulling it over. But they issued a letter of denial for this type of stunt saying that they believed that the flying public would, or, <clears throat> uh, or there was a possibility that the public and possibly even the flying public in aviation uh, would be endangered by a stunt like this. Yet when you look at the, this stunt, the FAA was really concerned about the fact that the, the public could be in, endangered on the ground and that aviation and aviation safety could be compromised. Yet the Red Bull team decided to try and do this uh, particular event anyway. And, uh, and it was half successful as the airplanes were, of course, pushed to the ground, standing vertical in the air, if you will, nose down. Uh, both pilots left their respective aircraft. One pilot was able to get into the opposing airplane and, uh, and gain control of it and land. Unfortunately, during uh, the excursion down, the other airplane had some sort of issue that caused it to start to spiral out of control. The pilot was unable to, to get into the airplane and therefore had to pull a parachute and land some distance away. The airplane eventually uh, crashed into an open desert area, fortunately. And while yes, nobody was endangered on the ground, if you will, the FAA had denied this particular action. And the question is, why would you jeopardize your pilot certificate for a stunt like this when the FAA has denied it? And similar to the previous stunt that the FAA took corrective action on, where a pilot, again, looking for YouTube subscribers and click-throughs and everything else to generate uh, internet interest, uh, that pilot ended up having his pilot certificate revoked for crashing a good airplane as well. 
And I suspect with the FAA looking at this particular stunt, the fact that it had been denied, um, I wouldn't be surprised if there isn't some revocation action take place with this. They are gonna try and send a very strong message. Aviation in and of itself is a dream for a lot of us. We admire the pilots that can do things, make airplanes dance, do things with aircraft um, that for our enjoyment, whether it's on the internet or in person at air shows. But when you start taking some of these stunts to an extreme like that, just to draw the attention, especially in this case on the internet, now you have to start looking at, is this really good for aviation? Does it draw the right attention to aviation? And in this particular instance, I saw no benefit other than somebody capitalizing uh, for monetary means a, a stunt like this to draw attention to uh, a respective uh, uh, website. And um, in the meantime, it compromised aviation and aviation safety and the perception by the non-flying public to these kinds of dangerous type stunts. So um, again, I'm all for great air shows. I love being entertained. A lot of my friends are in the air show business. It's very controlled. They're very methodical. They, they're, they're very practiced and skilled in their particular craft. And I hate to see aviation, especially that part of aviation, be tainted by some of these stunts that I will call ridiculous because there was no benefit in doing this kind of thing. So uh, again, from our WTF file, I have to just say, what the hell were you thinking? So with that being said, um, and lacking my, uh, my partner, I will have the last word, which is again, think about what it is you're gonna be doing with that aircraft. Think about the people that you're going to be flying and think about the people that aren't in the airplane that are below your aircraft on the ground. Because anytime you fly over any populated area, they too deserve the highest levels of safety from you as a pilot in command. You go back and look at FAR 91.3 and your responsibilities as the pilot in command. It's kind of like Spider-Man, um, you know, with, uh, with great power comes great responsibility. And as the pilot in command, you do have a lot of power, but you also have a lot of responsibility to yourself of course, to your passengers and to the people outside that aircraft. So again, do your planning and do a thorough and methodical job with not only what it is you're gonna do with the aircraft, how you're gonna do it with the aircraft, but then when you get to the airplane, pre-flight planning with regard to examining that aircraft to make sure that both you and the aircraft are in an airworthy condition to conduct that flight and do it safely. So with that being said, and I, again, I wanna thank all of our uh, viewers on YouTube and our podcast listeners, and of course our sponsors of Emco Insurance and PAMA. Uh, they make this show possible. We're always trying to upgrade, if you will, the show, and, and we appreciate the feedback from our viewers and listeners. We've had some great uh, feedback. We're trying to tailor the show based on that feedback. So please keep it coming. Uh, you'll hear at the end of the uh, segment how you can get in touch with us through our website and our email. And again, thank you. And please, on your subscriber, definitely subscribe. Give us, uh, give us a great rating so that we can continue to enhance this show. We look for more viewers. We look for more listeners. And, um, and that's what makes this show better. We try to address those situations, those scenarios, those accidents that have the greatest benefit to our audience. So thank you for that. And with all of that having been said, and without my partner's last word, I will sign us off from the Flight Safety Detectives. To listen or watch more episodes of this show, go to FlightSafetyDetectives.com, the Flight Safety Detectives YouTube channel, or your favorite place to listen to podcasts. To contact John and Greg about the show, send them an email at FlightSafetyDetectives at gmail.com. 
And remember, for aviation insurance needs, contact Avemco Insurance at avemco.com or give them a call at 888-879-0389. Mention Flight Safety Detectives and receive a 5% discount. Thanks for listening to the Flight Safety Detectives and remember to always fly safe.